Um, hello, everybody. This is Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party candidate for president and also the Socialist Party candidate in 2020. This is we call a podcast we call Green Socialist Notes, where we talk about the education and organizing to follow up on the eco-socialist program that Angela Walker and I ran on in 2020. And I'm at the Green Party of Pennsylvania state meeting. They're just wrapping up. I'm going to have a couple of the candidates on. They're putting together a group picture. They may have me come over there for that. Um, so this is a little... I haven't ever done this outside. I hope it looks good. My screen I should clean because hopefully you're not seeing a bunch of dots on my face that I'm seeing on the screen. Um, so let me move under the ease of this building. Yeah, that looks like a little better picture. And uh, okay, I'm gonna get in this picture. They just so can you see this is. Yeah, that's, that's who's here, some of them at this Pennsylvania Green Party meeting. So I'm just going to go over this picture. And this is a this is my podcast, so y'all on all over the country, yeah. So give me a second here, and I'll, I'll get we we'll have the U.S. Senate candidate for Pennsylvania Green Party and the lieutenant governor candidate. For Green Party here on a second. <laughs> and we'll have Dr. Claire Cohen, who's a physician, who actually I'm going to have on the program for the whole hour on the first. But I want to introduce you to her. Uh, we're going to talk about the healthcare system and also mass shootings because she works on uh, psychological issues and uh, has good things to say about that you know analysis so we're just about all right all right they want me to lower the computer but no my face you can see my face so uh, they take, be patient well, they got to get this picture i think that's the We got that done. So let me grab one of these candidates so we can get started. Or maybe have. Okay. Let's get, let's get Claire on first. Really, we're just going to introduce Claire. So come on, Claire. Yeah, so. This is Dr. Claire Cohen. She's a Green Party member from Pittsburgh. I've known Claire since the early 90s. She was interested in independent politics when Ron Daniels tried to run a presidential campaign, kind of trying to take advantage of the momentum around the Rainbow Coalition. So we're still here. Yes, we're still here. Still and, fighting. And Claire is working on, uh, you know, health care, socializing the health care system, the kind of community control national health care service that we talked about in the campaign and she's also works in the area of psychology psychiatry right? psychiatry, yeah. psychiatry and so she's got things to say about how that relates to the mass shootings we've been seeing um and you know what that means for the kind of social changes we need so i just wanted to introduce claire october 1st she's going to be the guest for the whole hour Sure. So okay. Thanks for stopping Thank by, and we'll see you October first. See you October first. Okay. It's good to see you today. Yes. Okay, they're taking another picture. Okay, I got another picture. Boy, the, the lighting was a lot better when I put it against the roof. Wasn't it? Yeah, 
ไรคะโอ้โนเฮ้ยใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใครใคร You're from the Pittsburgh area too, right? Yes. And you're an attorney. Yes. Okay. Well, why don't you tell people, you know, what your issues are and uh, what's going on with the campaign here in Pennsylvania? And yes. get up a little closer so people can see you. I'm Richard Weiss. I'm the Pennsylvania Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate. Our number one issue is the climate. We're in favor here in Pennsylvania. It's uh, fracking is a huge issue, and we're in favor of stopping any new fracking and phase out existing fracking as quickly as possible as we expand renewable energy. In addition to that, uh, I'm in favor of universal health care. I would support passing the current Medicare for All bill. Since it's already ready to go, we just vote on it. Uh, we're in favor of legalization of marijuana, um, reproductive rights, and we believe, although the Democrats give lip service to some of these issues, they, they're not going to actually do them. They've had the opportunity and they have shown time and again that they'll just pass it up and, and we'll continue the status quo. Yeah. Okay, so climate, single care, healthcare, and I was I was looking at the legalization of marijuana. Yeah, you don't have that in Pennsylvania yet, huh? Uh, no, I think there there might be a medical marijuana. Uh, there there is uh, some uh, licensing of marijuana, but I, I think people should be allowed to grow at home and, and sell their small quantities, uh, and, and there should be no issue with that. Okay. Well, we got to legalize in, in New York, but it's taking them slow to implement it. They just had another delay for the businesses that would dispense the marijuana, you know, the shops. So I think some people are afraid that legalization means over legalization, that, that they're going to issue licenses that are expensive, only certain businesses can sell. And that's the only way you can get it, and it's it's too expensive for most people. Well, that's definitely been an issue in New York. You got to make access to the business accessible, and particularly, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about people who actually knew the business, but it wasn't legal. You know, maybe should be the first people to get into it because they know how to market. They got a customer base from you know when they did do it. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of issues around implementation. Legalization once you get the go ahead at the at the state or level, but you're talking about federal legalization. Yes, I, I think that would be a great help because even when the states legalize, it's still illegal federally. And even though Biden campaigned on legalizing marijuana, there, there's more people incarcerated now for marijuana possession than before he became president. Yeah, and. He, that's one of the many things he said he would do that he hasn't moved on. You know? No, I think they, they want to fill the jails on these really nonviolent crimes that don't need to even be crimes like possession of marijuana. And then claim a victory that you know, if they were successful, then it was a good idea to hire 100,000 more police and fill the jails. But uh, we already incarcerate more people than any other country in the world. And I think uh, a lot of these nonviolent um, inmates don't, don't need to be in jail or prison. I hope people can hear because there's background noise from the meeting breaking up. If, if it is a problem, say so in the chat and I can move away from the crowd for a while because um, people are just standing around talking at the end of the meeting. Um, so in addition to that, uh, Along those lines, uh, I oppose cash bail. <clears throat> so many people are 
spending time incarcerated when they haven't even been committed of any crime simply because they can't afford bail. Yeah, we got uh, cash bail uh, reduced, you know, for a lot of categories of crime in New York State and the Republicans scream on bloody murder. Uh, crime rates have gone up, but there was a study done by the state comptroller saying no correlation between uh, bail or not having to get bail and uh, people going back out and committing more crime. Yet the Republicans made a big issue, and the Democrats, a lot of them have compromised with the Republicans on that. So they, they roll back the reforms a little bit. And then we see that nationally, you know, we get uh, mass shootings. And so Biden says the answer is to put 100,000 cops out there at the cost of billions of dollars and not deal with, uh, you know, some of the social roots of, of that kind of violence. I think that studies have shown that really uh, what increases crime is the, um, the difference in, in wealth. Uh, <clears throat> what, what people in the poorer communities really need is uh, actual health care, jobs, services, uh, and crime rates go down. Yeah, the... Uh one of those uh, study group uh, think tanks in Washington, I think it was the Center for Economic Policy and Research, uh, did a published a correlation between poverty and uh, shootings in low income black communities. And the more the poverty goes up, the more the shooting goes up. Uh, that was recent. So, yeah, there, you know. And in Pennsylvania, we have. Um the problem with uh, the, the jails are becoming overcrowded. It's really inhumane. So definitely, if there are inmates who are already elderly or infirm, there's no need for them to be incarcerated. If there are inmates who are in there merely for possession of cannabis and and not for any violent offense that there's no need for them to remain in, incarcerated there there are other programs that they could be released to <laughs> okay well any other things you'd like to tell the audience about you know your campaign or, you got a website can people send you money to help your campaign you know, I, I'm a, even more restrictive than the Green Party. The Green Party does not accept any corporate donations. I'm not accepting any donations. So I recommend that uh, any supporters donate to the Green Party of Pennsylvania. And that is at GPOFPA, which stands for GP, uh, Green Party of Pennsylvania. GPOFPA.org slash donate. Okay. Well, I know Senator Proxmire of Wisconsin used to not campaign on no money. He campaigned on his record. He was very, you know, active uh, senator, kind of a liberal, uh, but he had the power of incumbency. Well, listen, good luck. And, uh, you know, send some money to the Pennsylvania Green Party. They're running candidates around the state. Uh, it's what we need. Democrats ain't getting it done. There's a vacuum on the left that we can. And uh, Richard is one of the people doing it. So let me uh, grab the uh, candidate for lieutenant governor. And thanks. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> so. Uh,
Hi, everybody. This is David Rich from the Illinois Green Party series. I am behind the scenes here, but it looks like we're having some technical difficulties. So please stand by. Howie's out in Pennsylvania interviewing local candidates for different offices. We'll be right back. Okay, so I guess we're having a little more difficult technical difficulties than I suspected. Uh, anyway, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? Show, shoot me some 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 comments here in the in the chat box. Um, again, I'm David Rich from the Illinois Green Party series. I'm out here in Gray's Lake, Lake County, Illinois, northeast corner, right below Wisconsin, a little bit above Chicago. Uh, I have my uh, own show, Green Party show, on Mondays, seven to eight p.m. Central Time which is very cool. You get a lot of updates on different things uh, from climate change to social justice issues and all sorts of things in between. So you should check it out. It's very cool. Anyway, <clears throat> I love being a member of the Green Party. I was actually a member of the Libertarian Party um, before I joined the Green Party. And it turns out Libertarians are, they have some good ideas for sure, but they're a little crazy. Uh, so I joined the, the very rational, very sane and very <laughs> um, trustworthy Green Party, and I love being a part of it for sure. Um, so yeah, make some comments here on the, we can just chat here, whatever you want to talk about. Um, the elections are coming up soon and very important elections. These are very important elections. Uniquely evil. I love that name, by the way. Uh, I'll, if I ever have a chance to talk to you, I'll show you my tattoos. Good afternoon. How is the GP doing in Illinois? This is from a Amy L. Sachs. Do you have a ballot line? Are the Dems actively hostile as in New North Carolina? Thanks. Yes, they are. It's unbelievable. Um, the libertarians are like diet Republicans. Yes, they are just, they're, I mean, again, freedom is very important. Individual liberty is very important. There's no doubt. But like, that seems to be the only issue to them. Like, that's it. Like everything else. Could, oh, here we go. Howie's back. All right. Bye. Okay. So sorry about that. I hope people are still there. I was just going to introduce Michael Badges Canning who's the Pennsylvania Green Party candidate for uh, Lieutenant Governor here in New York. I'm just looking to see if the lighting, we're gonna, yeah, without, yeah, let's put it over here. I think that'll work. Well, those lights, hey, let me hold it up. So anyway, Michael, introduce yourself. Tell us uh, what you do and how you ended up running for Lieutenant Governor. Okay, well, I am uh, the mayor of my local borough, uh, Cherry Valley Borough in Butler County. I'm also an organizer with uh, Marcellus Outreach Butler, with uh, the Better Path Coalition, and several other uh, groups. Most specifically, lately, I'm with a group called Pennsylvania Pennsylvanians for Action on Climate. Um, and how I ran, I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. Well, my good friend, uh, PK, uh, Christine DiGiulio, is running for governor, and uh, she asked me if I would run with her for lieutenant governor. So that's how I got into this. <laughs> so you hear that all. This is a mayor. He's a green mayor. I am. You know, people think the Greens can't win. This guy's living proof that's not true. <laughs> so so what are some of the issues that you're emphasizing in this campaign? Well, the big thing for me is uh, there's two. Uh, one of them is climate. I'm, I'm heavily involved in, in the climate fight. Uh, and the second one is uh, corruption in Pennsylvania. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we have uh, no gift ban, so we can buy our politicians. Uh, unfortunately, most of us can't. We don't have enough money. But the, but the folks who do have money, the the, uh, the corporations and and the uh, the rich guys that want to buy special favors, they can do that. So they can do things like uh, uh, 
Super Bowl tickets, uh, meals. Every single day they're in Harrisburg, they can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with, with no, no accountability whatsoever. Uh, so th that's, those are the two big ones. But then also uh, the other reason I'm, I'm in this is to, uh, to help build the local green parties in, in Pennsylvania. We've been uh, hit pretty hard. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working to do that too. What do you mean hit hard? Well, <laughs> we had uh, a lot of folks leave the Green Party in Pennsylvania for uh, a savior, uh, Bernie Sanders, in 2015, 2016. They thought that he was going to uh, shake things up with the national picture. Uh, turned out he wasn't really much of a savior. But anyway, they left for that. And then they uh, then we had Trump. And uh that's that's been devastating. For instance, in Butler County, where I live, we had about 100 active Green Party folks in 2015. A lot of them left and said, oh, we'll be back after after the primary. And then Donald Trump won. And uh, now we're basically the, the Green Party in Butler is down to me. Um, we have some some folks who are minor. My, they're involved in a minor way, but uh, yeah, so that's, and that's happened statewide, except for in places like Allegheny County, uh, where we have a lot of young people who are doing the kind of deep organizing that, uh, that you advocate, Howie, and uh, so it's, they're, they're building up there. They're a powerhouse. So you still get elected mayor, even though all the Greens left for uh, the push of Bernie, or the push of Trump and the pull of Bernie into the Democratic Party. Yeah, well, I'm I'm in kind of a unique situation. I, being green or even a, even a Democrat would have been uh, difficult to be elected. I live in in what they call Trump country. Um, I live in a very rural section of, of Pennsylvania and very rural section of Butler County. And uh, I think what happens there is that uh, I've learned that you have to listen to people where they're at right now. Um, and so we talk about the issues that are important to them. My neighbors know who I am. They know I'm a green but they also know that I'm their neighbor and that uh, it, what I stand for is, is, is what they're standing for too. Well, and those kind of relationships are really important in political organizing and movement organizing. Absolutely. I mean, I saw Bernie Sanders. I was dropping leaflets for him when he first ran for office in 1972. He first ran for U.S. Senate in the spring special election and Vermont governor in the fall. And he got, you know, two or three percent. Uh, but over the years, he just kept at it, and he talks to people. He goes to rural Vermont, which at that time was, you know, Republican. Today, it's very Democratic. A lot of people from Brooklyn seem to have moved up there. But <laughs> the, the Republicans would say, uh, yeah, we know Bernie's a socialist, but Bernie talks to us. He listens to us. He cares about us. And, you know, we trust him, even if they didn't agree with him on all his policies. And that's, you know, I was talking today to the Pennsylvania Green Party about deep organizing or deep canvassing, which I've mentioned on this podcast, where you go out and you listen, you don't preach and you build relationships. And then, you know, then you can talk about the politics. And as I pointed out, there's a lot of political science research says that's the most persuasive form of political communication. These 30 second ads just mobilize one side or the other and they, they make us dumber because it's all about, you know, pushing our buttons one way or the other, positive or negative. And, you know, so people vote with their guts without thinking about much about the issues what can they stand for. So, yeah, that's and I think you're also people say, well, you know, the Democrats have ignored rural America. The Greens should not, because right away we can be the second party, if not the first party, because the Democrats have neglected it. And same thing on the reverse side in the cities. You know, the Republicans are neglecting that. We should be the second party, at least, yeah. in the cities. And, uh, you know, that's what we've done in, in uh, Syracuse, New York, and other cities uh, where the Greens have, you know, urban green movements. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, for, I'm, I'm going to talk, talk about rural areas. Uh, we are ignored by the Democrats. They don't, they don't talk about our issues. Uh, and the, the Republicans pander to us and then, and then they or, ignore us anyway. Uh, they say all the right stuff, but they don't they don't they don't come through with the, the right stuff. So, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of validity to what you just said. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've campaigned across upstate rural New York, also Trump country. And I've had Republicans come to me in towns and say, Howie, the people running this town are a bunch of crooks. It's a clique. And everybody's a Republican. They want. They're looking to the Green Party to help them get rid of this, these crooked Republicans. 
And these are Republicans asking for help. Yeah. When you get to the grassroots, it's uh, it's a lot different than it is in the, you know, uh, mudslinging down in Washington or in your state capital. Because, right. you know, I'm sure I bet the issues you're dealing with are things like, you know, uh, you know, water, sewers, roads. Well, the other one that's that's huge right now is uh, internet access. Uh, mm. We in we in, in rural areas have terrible internet access, and and what was really pointed up during the uh, the pandemic. Uh, I live very close to my my two two of my grandkids, and when they started doing remote schooling. Uh, those kids would come to our house when when their parents were working. And what would happen is that if one of them was on the Internet for their remote schooling and the other one tried to get on for their remote schooling, our system would crash. And we're actually in a good place. We have what they call broadband. Uh, it's terrible. It's uh, on a good day. It's three point four mega megabits per second, which is bad. The uh, FCC says twenty five megabits per second is uh, is basic. So it would crash. Our kids, our grandkids would, would struggle, but we weren't the worst off. We had kids in our school district who had to travel to the, the high school parking lot to access their, their internet uh, classes, their remote learning. And as a consequence, they were sitting in their, in these cars <laughs> in the middle of winter. It's yeah, that's, there's something wrong there. So that's, that's a big deal. And then also there are studies that say if you have better internet connection, you can bring more jobs into places. And we are in a job, uh, it's a bad place. We've been bleeding jobs and young people for the last 40 years. Uh, they don't stick around because there's no jobs there. So yeah, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a real big issue. Well, listen, I, I appreciate you coming on. Well, I appreciate you being here. And I usually answer questions here for the second half hour. Of the podcast. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you and good luck. Thanks. And uh, I have to get you to town someday. See, <laughs> see what a mayor's town looks like. <laughs> it's, it's a tiny little one. Okay, we'll see. You. All right. Take care. So I think the internet's better here inside this church. So I'm going to do the next half hour in here. Just looking for a place where I can sit down and you can see me. Which means maybe I should grab a chair and move it under the light. Oh, and face this way. That works. Okay, so kind of fly, kind of improvising here at this Green Party meeting, which just ended. So they had me come down here to uh, ask me to speak about, you know, something that would rally the party. And I saw a question here at the very beginning. Um, about somebody's asking, you know, how do we sustain ourselves? Um, I'm looking for that question because that's kind of what I addressed. Um, hmm, so it was right up near the top in my chat. Well, uh, I can't find it right away. Well, you know, I think the question or the comment was, yeah, here you go. How have you guys, this is from Uniquely Evil, how have you guys maintained momentum over the years? How are you not completely cynical at this point? Well, I, I think one reason the Green Party is still around, we started organizing in 1984, is that we keep getting replenished by Democrats. Most Greens are really pissed off former Democrats who got mad because the Democrats were on the other side of the barriers on an issue that we were concerned with, like fracking or a war or fair housing or affordable housing. And we found the Democrats were really with the developers and the landlords. And so people come to us for, as an alternative. So I think that's one reason we've maintained momentum. I think another is that we have uh, the rudiments of a uh, organization, you know, the basic structure. So there's a way for people to come together and continue to work together over time. Um, and then we've had victories, you know, like Michael, who was just here, you know, he's a mayor. Uh, we've elected, I think we've won something like, you know, over 1400 uh, races over the years. We currently have over 100 people in office. So uh, 
you know, we've had victories. And then in terms of the issues we're pushing, I mean, I'll just use my example of New York. Um, you know, I got 5% of the vote in 2014 running for governor. And after that, Andrew Cuomo had wanted to run up the vote, get more than his father ever got, Mario Cuomo, uh, more than he got in 2010, because he wanted to get ready to run for president and have a big vote, you know, to, as a credential. And, <coughs> and he got less. And he had to look at what we were talking about, a ban on fracking, $15 minimum wage, uh, uh, paid family leave. These are things he had never supported. After that election, he got behind him and rebranded himself from being the socially liberal fiscal conservative to being what he called the pragmatic progressive. So he had to pick up some of our issues. So we, we had a victory there on you know, the fracking issue. I mean, everybody from the Saudis to the Chinese to Wall Street was investing in what they called the shale play to frack the uh, Marcellus shale and the Utica shale beneath it in New York and Pennsylvania. <coughs> and we stopped them in New York. And, you know, we were up against really powerful forces with lots of money, but we won. So those victories keep us going. And how are you not completely cynical? Well, my main, my first point with the people today was that um, we need to not get discouraged. Um, social movements don't, you know, or social change doesn't develop as a, you know, a series of small, linear, gradual reforms. It comes in steps. You know, there's a burst of activity. And, you know, there's, there's big change in a short period of time. One famous revolutionary, I can't remember which one, said sometimes, uh, you know, what is it? Years go by. Well, I forget. It. The basic point is sometimes nothing changes. And then in a few weeks, you have years of change. I can't remember the exact quote. I mean, that's how it works. You know, movements like Occupy, you know, the objective conditions were there. You know, inequality was growing. People are hurting coming out of the Great Recession. Uh, but it wasn't until three years after that, 2011, when Occupy exploded. Police brutality goes on and on. But then we saw George Floyd get murdered on TV by the police. <coughs> and we had an explosion of demonstrations. So uh, the point is, you know, uh, you, you don't be cynical. You look at history and see that sometimes you just keep plugging away and then you're going to, you know, break through. And just having that perspective, I think, keeps you going. <coughs> so I wanted to answer that question. And I should have brought a glass of water with me here, but I'll see if I can keep going for another half hour. Um, so let's see what other questions we have. Or, um Talking about legalized marijuana. Yeah, noise in the background. Well, that's not a problem now. Good afternoon. How's the Green Party doing it? Do you have a ballot line? Are there Dems actively hostile as in North Carolina? I guess that was about Pennsylvania. Uh, in Pennsylvania, they don't have a permanent ballot line. They had to get 5,000 signatures for the statewide candidates, and they succeeded. I came down and spent a weekend helping them get those signatures. And, you know, their margin wasn't that great. The Democrats, you know, could have made a fight of it. They chose not to in Pennsylvania. And I haven't talked to anybody here, you know, to get, you know, any speculation or any direct knowledge as to why that is. Um, because in North Carolina, they definitely went after them. Uh, there's another case just came to my attention this week, and that is in South Carolina, there's a labor party that's independent, wanted to run its own candidates. And so they had a convention and nominated them. And the Democrats challenged, the same Democrats that challenged Matthew Ho in uh, North Carolina and, you know, the Elias law firm people, Mark Elias. And what they said is the law said you had to have your convention something like March, and they had theirs in July, even though there's plenty of time to print the ballots. 
And so they got knocked off the ballot in court. But you know what? The Democrats did the same thing. They didn't nominate till July, but they're on the ballot. I guess nobody sued them. And, and I guess if the Greens went to the same court, they could sue the Democrats, knock them off the ballot, and then you only have Republicans running, uh, which the Greens probably don't want to do. But, you know, that's another case where the Democrats, you know, they suppress the vote because a lot of people won't vote if we're not on the ballot. They, people come out to vote for us. Uh, they don't come out and vote for the lesser evil if we're not on the ballot. A lot of people. I mean, the main statistic we have on that is from the 2016 exit polls from the presidential election, 61 percent of Jill Stein's voters uh, would have stayed home if she was not on the ballot. So uh, we bring new people out and the Democrats, by suppressing the Green Party, are suppressing the vote. And then they try to point fingers at the Republicans for voter suppression, which the Republicans are definitely doing in the states they control. But, you know, where are the Democrats in stopping that? H.R. 1, you know, the For the People Act, that was their top priority when this new session of Congress came in. Democrats couldn't get that passed because they wouldn't, you know, lift the filibuster, which has been the, the racist uh, defense, their ability to veto uh, majority support for civil rights and voting rights that we've had in this country. They've used that filibuster for generations. And here we are. And, you know, Biden and Schumer didn't make it a priority. So the Democrats couldn't get, you know, voting rights passed. And then they turn around and suppress the Green Party and suppress more voters. So I, you know, what I, we talked about this today when I spoke, uh, we need to, the Green Party, take the lead on democracy, voting rights. And, you know, that includes the right to vote for who you want which means third parties for a lot of us. So it's both uh, removing these voter restrictions for individuals and then removing the restrictions to access to the ballot for the Green Party and other third parties, like this other progressive party in South Carolina, the Labor Party, which the Democrats just knocked off the ballot. You know, you'd think you were reading about a, an authoritarian country. You know, that's maybe what the United States is in while the Republicans definitely are that way, the Democrats, as the judge said in the North Carolina case, Matthew Ho's case, after all the Democrats did, the judge said or wrote in their decision, or maybe they said it in court. I, I read it in the news account. They said the Democrats don't come to this court with clean hands because of what they were doing to the Green Party, trying to keep them off the ballot. So that's what we got to fight. So... Here's a question, Betty Dimmitt. How are we not opposed to an entire industry operating via business model of maximizing and monetizing the spread of disease that kills mainly through complications, roughly the same number of people every year in the US as COVID did in the, its first year? An industry that pursued that business model in ways that resulted in major companies being convicted of RICO violations. This disease, of course, is nicotine addiction and the internal documents of the industry that have been made available. Yeah, um, yeah, that's clearly a case of corporate crime. Uh, they have had to, you know, make some reparations. I thought you were getting to opioids, uh, which is another case where these pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, just uh, made a, a lot of money by uh, selling people uh, or, you know, selling their drugs and pharmacies that were obviously uh, feeding addictions to people that needed help and caused a lot of death from uh, opioid overdoses. Or when people can't get their prescriptions anymore, they go to street drugs like heroin laced with fentanyl, and people are still dying fast. They're dying. I mean, I know people in Syracuse that died from fentanyl or I know people whose family members did. And uh, I think we had four deaths this week in Syracuse, or four deaths in one day this week. Uh, it is still a big problem. And then you have this a Democrat, Gavin Newsom. Uh, they, there was a bill for safe injection sites in California and, and Newsom vetoed it. And that's gonna be, that's gonna cause people death. You know, if people, if people are addicted, let them get safe drugs and then offer, uh, you know, the, the, the addiction treatment 
if they want it. And, you know, most people at some point decide that's what they want rather than be being high all the time or just using the drug to avoid the consequences or the feelings of withdrawal. So opioids have a legitimate purpose. Yes, they do. Um, but when people are addicted and it's beyond their legitimate purpose, we need to have health. How many deaths a week from nicotine addiction? Don't know the number, but it's too many. <clears throat> Howie, how can we lobby for Big Pharma to market a cure for lung cancer like Cuba has? I think they have a vaccine, not a cure, and I don't understand how it works. But the question is, why do we even have Big Pharma? Why don't we have a public uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry like Cuba does, which has you know done a lot of uh, innovative research on uh, you know vaccines like the, the the lung cancer vaccine, and uh, they've got a vaccine for COVID. Um, you know they have been able to develop. You know the the capitalists will tell you, well, they don't have the profit incentive, but you know most of the people doing the research are not doing it to make a killing in the market. They're doing it because they're fascinated by the science and they're motivated by doing, you know, good for people. And so, you know, pay them a good salary, but don't make it dependent on profits because then the drug companies, when it's dependent on profits, they will pick the kind of drugs that will make them lots of money. So a vaccine, if it works, uh, depends on the disease, but sometimes just one injection and you're good for life. Others, you may need one injection a year, like the flu. It's a, it's a disease that, you know, keeps evolving, so you need updates. Um, but uh, you can have, you know, good innovation. I mean, science is a common endeavor. It's a, it's knowledge is our common inheritance, and the idea that we're privatizing knowledge with these property, intellectual property rights, is an affront to science, which advances by people sharing what they know, and uh, you know, standing on the on the shoulders of previous research. So, yeah, uh, we should, we should uh, lobby for big pharma. How do you lobby big pharma? They're not elected. You know, they, you can write them a letter. I got arrested once trying to deliver, deliver a letter to uh, one of the healthcare companies. It was about single payer healthcare. It was about when they were debating Obamacare and wouldn't let, you know, members of Congress like John Conyers even present his single payer bill. And so this was part of protests we did at that time. And so they wouldn't let me in the door. I stood in the door with this letter and they wouldn't take it and I got arrested. I spent the night in jail and had to do six months community service. Kind of kind of steep uh, uh, sanctions for that kind of action, but it was a, uh, I was the only one. There was a group protesting with me, but I was the only one that uh, got arrested. And actually, it was a liberal judge who knew me. <laughs> but anyway, I survived. So what else we got here? Yeah, somebody points out Jonas Salk sold the polio vaccine patent for a dollar. You know, why can't? Well, the pharmaceutical companies won't do that because they're in it for the money, not the health care. Mississippi government wants to privatize Jackson's water. Yeah, they, they, they starve the city for resources so they can't maintain a decent water system. And uh, then they want to privatize it. And then there'll be money coming from the state so it can be passed on to the private water company. That's how it works. Look at Flint, Michigan, you know, where they uh, had a perfectly good water system taking water from uh, the Great Lake, I forget, it was probably Michigan, um, and they switched it to a river that was polluted by industrial waste, corroded the pipes, they had lead poisoning. And that's what happens when you take democracy away from the people, because what happened there was uh, they, they, uh, they said the city was in fiscal crisis, so the state uh, took power away from the elected government and put it in the city uh, manager who made that decision 
and destroyed Flint's water system. And they say, you know, people aren't smart enough to have democracy, blah, blah, blah. What happened in Michigan was, and I know this was true for Detroit, probably was true for Flint, is that uh, they agreed, they made some agreement with the state to accept a manager in return for funding. Or they, they made some kind of deal with the state for revenue sharing, you know, to help fund the cities. And then the state reneged on that promise, put the cities into financial crisis, and then said, see, you can't take care of your finances. We're going to appoint a manager for you. And that's how we got to Flint. It was, uh, shouldn't have happened that way. So what else is on people's minds? I'm looking for questions here in the chat. <clears throat> so when I when I spoke to people, I spoke uh, today in, oh, well, here we go. With Betty Dimmitt, universal healthcare is impossible as a standalone in the US. We are 62nd among nations in the ratio of doctors to population. Single-payer single health care has to be packaged with single-payer education so that we can catch up on the supply side of health care. That's a great point. Um, you know, uh, you can say everybody can have health care, but then uh, if you don't have enough doctors, people are going to at least have to wait for the health care. And we don't have enough doctors, and we should uh, not make that scarce. I know among, you know, going back to Cuba, there's a much higher ratio of doctors to population than we have in the United States. And so, you know, as I understand it there, you basically have neighborhood doctors like the, like we used to have in this country where, you know, doctors will make home visits. You don't have to go to the hospital or the clinic. So that's a great point. We got to make it easier and, and becoming a doctor is you know a long process expensive process allows doctors going to debt so they may want to be a general practitioner uh but they can't afford to do that they got to go into the higher paying specialties to pay off all that student debt and that's one reason we have uh, a shortage of uh, general practitioners you know your primary care physicians and also uh pediatric petitions to take care of children because they don't pay as much as some of these specialties. And when they pay off those debts, people go for the high paying specialties. What's your opinion on student loans? Well, I my opinion is the loans out there now, we should cancel. Uh, many of them were uh, undertaken on false pretenses. They were uh, undertaken uh, for public colleges and universities, it should be tuition free like they were in the 60s, into the early 70s. Uh, so they, people shouldn't have had to borrow for tuition, certainly. Um, and they've been paying interest on their loans. Some people pay interest. And, uh, you know, actually, you have to pay off the interest before the uh, principal starts to shrink. So if you just pay the interest, you keep, you know, paying the interest forever. Uh, we shouldn't have interest on those loans because the point is to help students get education, not make money for the federal government. So I think that's what we should do with the student loans that are outstanding. Going forward, we should have a reasonable repayment program for those that need to borrow money. If they go to a private school, if they decide they need to borrow the money for living expenses, although we might consider like we did in the GI Bill after World War II, that your tuition is covered, also your living expenses. Uh, you get a stipend for that, uh, at least for four years, you know, to get that undergraduate degree. Um, but what loans students take out uh, should be done through a federal program, should be interest-free or the principal adjusts to the rate of inflation, but no additional interest. Um, the repayment plan should be five or 10, you can, you know, fussing around with the numbers, but five or 10% of your income above the poverty line uh, for a maximum of 20 years. At that point, any outstanding loan is forgiven. So, you know, while well, people contribute to their payment, but they're not burdened so much that they can't get on with life, you know, get married, buy a home, have children, 
that's what a lot of students with, uh, you know, or former students with uh, outstanding loans, they're delaying, you know, their lives to pay the damn loans off. Um, so that's my opinion on student loans, you know, cancel what we got and then have a reasonable student loan program going forward. Tuition free at public colleges and universities and trade schools and, uh, you know, grants, Pell Grants for uh, students going to uh, private universities to help cover their tuition or living expenses. You know, there should be there should be investment in higher education so everybody has an opportunity to go as far as their interest and energy will take them. Yeah, Mr. Anderson says universal programs. Yeah, I, I think that's what we need to emphasize in most cases for social programs. Otherwise, you know, wherever the cutoff point is in the means tested program, the people just beyond it resent the people just before it who are basically in the same position. Whereas you have a universal program, everybody benefits and everybody supports it pretty much. Mr. Anderson asks, has the Green Party made a statement on the possibility of a railroad strike. The train companies have been hiding behind the government to avoid negotiations. Um, I don't know if the Green Party has. I've been getting information about it. Um, I should probably make a statement. Um, and a railroad strike uh, isn't as crippling as it once was because we have so much of our freight moved on the roads, but it's still uh, gonna have a big impact in um, so, yeah, I actually got to look more into it. I have uh, friends who are retired railway workers, and they've been sending me all kinds of stuff. I've been putting them in a file. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But this will probably uh, stimulate me to get up to speed on that, on that issue. Yeah, Frankie Lee, the New Deal led people to being better educated and living longer. And then the rich said, enough of that. Yeah, it was really in the 70s. They were having a declining profits after the so-called golden age of capitalism, uh, starting in the late 60s. And then you had uh, Powell, the guy who became a Supreme Court justice, wrote that memo to the Chamber of Commerce and complained that, uh, you know, instead of a handful of oligarchs, military people, and, uh, you know, the president and his cabinet getting together and making decisions. Now they had to talk to black people and women and environmentalists. And uh, it was becoming too socialistic for Lewis Powell. And uh, he wrote this memo basically telling the Chamber of Commerce, you better get the capitalists organized. Didn't quite put it in those terms. Uh, he was really upset with Ralph Nader, who was organizing people around consumer issues on a, a wide basis and uh, getting regulations like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, you know, seat belts. That really upset Lewis Powell, who was a corporate lawyer. Um, and so from the 70s on, yeah, the rich said enough of that, partly because they wanted to restore profits. So, uh, you know, they wanted to uh, have us work and produce more for the same or less wages so they could have more. And also to break us politically. So, you know, they went after unions and uh, began, you know, investing heavily in politics. And so they weakened, you know, the New Deal Democrats disappeared real quick after that. And they became the corporate New Democrats who were for neoliberal austerity. You know, let the market do it, privatize things, uh, don't have public services and public goods so much and uh, we've been on that trajectory now for 50 years and inequality has grown and the number of people having a hard time making ends meet has grown and people are fed up with it so you know the the new deal programs uh you know is the question can capitalism with chronic overproduction and stagnation afford the new deal programs I think, you know, they certainly, I think it certainly can. We can tax the rich and at least provide basic health care and education and uh, more housing that's affordable. Um, 
You don't need a socialist revolution for that. Uh, we've seen countries in Europe do that for years. They've cut back, but they still do it a lot more than we do. So I think that's possible. But we need to do more than that. How are we going to deal with this climate crisis without an eco-social solution? You know, capitalism, you just can't, like the Democrats want to do with their so-called Green New Deal, you know, provide grants and subsidies and tax breaks and expect corporations to, to do what is a very complex transition of our whole economy and its te technological infrastructure. That requires coordination instead of hundreds of companies making their own individual separate decisions based on their own bottom lines. But that's what we, that's what we get right now. <coughs> so that's to say, uh, I believe, you know, the state and, and American capitalism could afford some of these New Deal programs. Even some programs we didn't get in the New Deal, like Medicare for all. Uh, but that still doesn't mean we shouldn't go on to a, a social solution for economic democracy, particularly to deal with the climate change. <coughs> so Ryan Yobbs, Howie, how do you view DSA as an allied party or do you have political differences with them? Well, first of all, they're not a party, and that's the problem. They are inside the Democratic Party. That's their formal policy. Now, there are a lot of members, rank and file of DSA, that don't agree with that. They believe in, you know, in this classical socialist position of political class independence for the working class. Uh, but the, the leadership, and coming out of the last convention, they have a much more of an emphasis of working with inside the Democratic Party. <coughs> so I disagree with them on that. Um, a lot of ways they're like the Green Party. I lost that question. Where did it go? Um, in that it's kind of loose. And so, you know, there you get different factions or committees uh, saying different things. So it's sometimes hard to say, well, what is the DSA position? Um, but, you know, my main beef with them is uh, they're oriented to the Democratic Party. <coughs> so that's the big political difference. And when it comes to, you know, specific policies and resolutions, yeah, I have a problem with some of their things. I think their uh, position that their international committee came out with on uh, the, the on Ukraine is problematic. It, it doesn't say clearly Russian troops out. Uh, it doesn't provide any concrete support to the struggle for national liberation and survival for the Ukrainian people. It looks at it in a geopolitical framework, you know, US imperialism versus Russia. I'm not even sure they call Russia imperialist. Although, you know, when you invade a country, uh, drive 13 million people, a third of the population from their homes. Uh, and then in occupied territories, uh, you know, make people go through, uh, filtration camps to be interrogated and maybe tortured and even killed and imprisoned if they don't agree with the occupation. In some cases, it looks like hundreds of thousands of cases, separating their children uh, from the families to be brought up as Russians in uh, Russia. Uh, and then, you know, having that in occupied territories all leading up to uh, sham referenda to occupy, annex, these territories, that is imperialism if it ever was. And we have too many quote unquote anti-imperialists that, yeah, they can see US imperialism and oppose that, but they can't oppose Russian imperialism. Uh, you know, they're, they're taking the other side in the Cold War. And I believe we should be internationalists and side with the working class, not either camp of imperialism. So, and so the DSA statement on, on Ukraine uh, is problematic. And they did a, what was it, a, a webinar recently where I didn't see it, but I've seen, read a report on it. Apparently nobody called for the Russian troops to withdraw from Ukraine. You know, if the Russian troops would do, we'd have peace. But if the Ukrainians don't have the weapons to resist, there, there won't be Ukraine much longer. So I have beef with them on that. On the other hand, you know, the DSA groups doing Good work on things like uh, in New York State, uh, having the New York State Power Authority get the authority to build renewable generation facilities. They don't have that now, aside from the 
hydropower plants they've owned for decades. <coughs> and, uh, you know, they've been working on a housing issue. We have legislation for a good cause eviction, which is, uh, you know, you just can't evict anybody because you want to. You got to have, you know, good cause that they, they violated the terms of their lease or they didn't make payments. Instead of just kicking them out, what happens a lot in New York City in particular is with a gentrifying, they'll just push the tenants out because they, they want to upgrade the building and, and get a much higher price for their apartments. So they'll kick people out in the streets, even though they've been paying their rent and uh, being good tenants. So, you know, DSA's worked on that legislation. So I have worked with DSA on issues, but as an organization, um, you know, I, I, as a socialist and just by experience, I think uh, we got to have an independent political party that is not tied or integrated in or providing cover for the capitalists who, you know, are definitely running the Democratic Party. <clears throat> so I'm going to look for one more question. It's getting on four, even though we did have a little break there. I was sorry about that. But the internet seems to be holding up now. <clears throat> well, I, I see a couple comments on Ukraine. Well, let's see what this one. What is the future of leftist politics in the US? Do you think a viable national third party will emerge? Or can we salvage the Democratic Party by winning more local elections? Uh, the Democratic Party cannot be salvaged. Um, you know, it's it's been around for 200 years, and every time the left goes into it, it disappears. Uh, classic example or early example was William Jennings Bryan. The Populist Party, the People's Party, went into the Democratic Party because uh, they got bamboozled because he's a phony populist. He didn't really believe in the populist program, and the populists disappeared. Now the socialists took their place. A lot of the Socialist Party people, the Debsian Socialists, were former populists. Um, so they had to rebuild it. Um, you know, the, the energy of the New Deal went into the Democratic Party, and the left stopped being, you know, at socialist perspective, stopped being a distinct perspective in this country for generations after that. Now, it's really only recently that it's, it's become a term of uh, common debate rather than a term of, uh, you know, an epithet. Um, and you had the Rainbow Coalition, you know, around Jesse Jackson. Um, <clears throat> the Democrats absorb, it's where the old saying goes, you know, social movements go to die. Um, so no, we're not going to, you know, reform the Democratic Party. We should, like most other countries in the world, have a multi-party system with a party on the left. And that means not just Greens electing thousands of people, which we could do at the local level because we have a high winning percentage there and there's, you know, about 500,000 officers up for election across the country. There's, it's a good place to get a start in politics and build from there to the state and congressional level. Uh, but also we got to change the electoral system, rank choice voting and proportional rank choice voting for legislative offices. That will create a multi-party system and the Greens will definitely be a part of that. And then once we're in the argument on a constant basis, and I think we can win the argument on a lot of these issues and win the people. So uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> and then the, the Ukraine stuff, I'll just say briefly about that because we're going to run over time. <clears throat> I think somebody said, uh, yeah, we should condemn Russia, but the US provoked them. Uh, Look, there's been inter-imperialist rivalry between the U.S. and Russia for a long time. Uh, but to say, because, you know, we provoked them with, uh, you know, actions that uh, Russia didn't like, that's an excuse for them to invade and, and wreak all that carnage on Ukraine. No excuse for that. That's you know, the crime of aggression is a supreme war crime, as they said during the Nuremberg trial. So... Uh, I don't think Russia should get any excuse. Neither, but that doesn't mean we should let the US, the US off either. You know, their uh, response to the geopolitical concerns that Putin was raising at the end of 2021, 
uh, were, you know, dismissive and disrespectful. And the U.S. has a lot of nerve being that way since we're the ones that unilaterally pulled out of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, and back in Bush years, the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missiles Treaty. And, you know, with NATO right on Russia's border, I don't care if you had, a, you know, a green eco-socialist government in Moscow, they'd be, you know, concerned. They'd have reason to be concerned with, you know, NATO and all those weapons right up on their border. Um, but those have been up on the border since 2004. There have been some more added recently, you know, 2013, 14. Is it those years? Anyway, recently for anti-ballistic missiles, Obama deployed them, <coughs> which, you know, Russia's where it could be converted to offensive uh, weapons. And the anti-ballistic missiles, we say it's to stop Iranian missiles going that way to Europe, but you know Russia looks at that like those are there to stop our nukes, so the U.S. might do a first nuclear strike. And we have not pledged to not use nukes first. A no first use pledge would be something the U.S. should do, which Russia has done, although they seem to be walking back from that. <coughs> but all that you know, diplomatic jockeying is no excuse for Russia's invasion and no excuse for socialist internationalists or people in the green politics tradition who cut their teeth on opposing the Euro missiles on both sides of the Cold War. And Petra Kelly, you know, was, was known for going to the East, to the Soviet bloc to demonstrate and lobby for human rights. And to, I'm speaking in a podcast. And, uh, you know, for the Tibetan national rights in China, as well as criticizing, uh, you know, the Western powers. So am I right here? You're not with the church to kick me out? No, I'm just here to use the restroom. I was here. Oh, okay. Good. Um, so uh, so what was I talking about? Ukraine. So I think... Uh, you know, we should be in solidarity. I've talked with Greens and uh, environmental activists and socialists and trade unionists in Ukraine. By Zoom, I talked live with the Ukrainian socialist uh, who was on this podcast. And I spent a lot of time with her in Chicago last weekend, you know, getting more up to speed. And I have to say, you know, the left in Ukraine is mad as hell at the peace movement and the left in the United States because it's not shown the solidarity they would expect. They're fighting imperialist invaders and people are hemming and hawing about sending them arms to defend themselves or putting sanctions on the invaders. And, you know, they wonder if that's what the left, if that's what the left is about, what's it good for? And of course, you know, they're gonna continue to fight for a progressive uh, change in Ukraine. They're fighting Zelensky harder than the so-called peace activists who complain about him. They call them, you know, a Nazi government. That's not true. It's a neoliberal government. It's viciously neoliberal. But, you know, the so-called coup in 2014, the Ukrainians laugh at that. And, you know, they say, we didn't get out on the Maidan, that square, for three months in below zero weather because Victoria Yulin and John McCain brought us pastries. You know, they had demands against police brutality, for democracy, for honest elections. The Euro, you know, EU stuff, that initially kicked it off, but that was just some students. It was small until the students were about to give up at the end of November 2013. And Yanukovych's goons came and beat the crap out of them. And then thousands of people came out because it became a, a, a protest of the uh, brutality, uh, the police brutality of Yanukovych, as well as, you know, the democracy, which had been the issue you know, the first time he was elected and by, a, a, you know, a fixed election in, you know, 2004 in the Orange Revolution. And uh, so, no, it was a popular revolution. And, you know, the, the lefties in uh, Ukraine wonder, you know, wh who are these lefties in the West that are afraid of revolution? This was a popular movement. It wasn't a socialist revolution like they would like, but it's definitely a popular movement. It was a pro-democracy movement. So all I can say is uh, they would like to see uh, some real solidarity from the left here, and I think we should give it. And uh, you know, we're 10 minutes over time, and I 
don't want to, you know, use too much of your time. We'll, we'll be here next week, uh, the 17th. And uh, <clears throat> I may have a candidate as a guest. Um, next get oh, and I'm going to try to get uh, Yulia Yurchenko back on to deal with some of these uh, misunderstandings of Ukraine that uh, are circulating around the left and the peace movement in this country. People, you know, they're, they're basically taking the Russian line on, and a lot of it's just made up stuff. So uh, that should be interesting. And, and we just got to set a date. So those are things coming up. And thanks for hanging with us. Go drink some water. That's the first thing I'm thinking about, Ryan, because my whistle is dry. And uh, I guess we'll see you next week. I'm running out of juice here in time. And uh, I'll be sitting in the Green Party office in Syracuse next time. So hopefully we won't. Uh, can you get someone from Russia, Howie? I can get an exile. The left in Russia is keeping their head low. Um, or, you know, actually, I'm thinking I talked with a Russian uh, a Greenpeace activist before the invasion. And when the invasion happened, he split for Kyrgyzstan. He was afraid they were going to come get him. Um, they're from a socialist in Russia. I agree, yeah. Let's see what we can do. Uh, Boris Kagerlitsky is somehow, you know, writing stuff. He has to put on his uh, writings that he's a foreign agent, even though he isn't. Um, and uh, Matt Taibbi, is, uh, you can subscribe to this, it's called Russian Descent. So Boris Kagerlitsky, who's been a Russian socialist dissident going back to, you know, Gorbachev, they, uh, uh, who was before Gorbachev? Um, Brezhnev days. Every uh, leader of Russia has jailed this guy. Yet he's still in Russia. He teaches at Moscow State University. And somehow he, he's able to say what he says without, you know, going over the line to where they got to arrest him again. Although I wouldn't be surprised if he spent some time in jail again. Anyway, um, love to have him on. He's, he's very sharp. So I'll see what I can do about that. So anyway, uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next week.